Good afternoon, Oakstone. Such a pleasure to see you guys today. Gorgeous day outside. It's been a few weeks since I've been here. So good to see everyone. I think the last time I was here, I said that uh, every time we come here, that um, it feels like a family reunion. It does. And uh, I was thinking about it today, and it's more than that. It really is. I think most of you guys, you know that when you, you fellowship before and after service, um, there's something very special about it, something very sweet. Um, and I was thinking about that scripture, I think it's in Luke chapter 1, where Mary, she's pregnant with Jesus, and she goes to see her cousin Elizabeth. You guys remember the story? And um, when Mary approaches Elizabeth, she gives uh, Elizabeth a greeting. Now, Elizabeth, she's pregnant with John the Baptist. And remember what happened with John the Baptist in the womb? What happened? He leapt, right? And there is something about whenever you're with people who have Jesus living inside them. There's something about your spirit that just leaps, doesn't it? And that's the way that I feel every time that we get together. You can't, it's hard to describe because it's supernatural. It's not something that we fake. It's, something, it's not something that we try to stir up. It just can't help but happen when you're in that presence of Jesus. And it's just so amazing. And I just thank God. I thank God that he's given Oakstone to us, given us this place where we can meet and, and have all this joy and happiness and fellowship and this family love for one another. So, oh, it's just so good to be here. Um, let's begin in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for this group of believers who's, who are here today. And Jesus, I want to thank you. We sang so much about what you did for us on the cross, how your sacrifice paid for our sins. The veil was rent. A whole new world was opened up to us because of that. We're able to meet together as brothers and sisters in the faith because of what you did. And we just praise you. We thank you for that, Lord Jesus. And Father, I just desire to elevate and exalt your son today. That all of our eyes would be turned to him because I know that is what you desire of us. To worship Jesus is to worship you, and to worship you is to worship Jesus. You are one. So, Father, I'm praying that today that we would turn our eyes heavenward, that we would fix our gaze, fix our gaze on the Savior that you gave us. And may he be exalted today in this message, Lord. May every word that proceeds out of my mouth be only from you. May you be exalted, great God. May we all leave here today better off than we came in, closer to you, ready to hit the world uh, running, to hit the world running, not to hit the world, but Lord, just to get out there and to, to do what you have given to us this job that you've given to us, to be ambassadors of Christ. May this message better prepare us, Lord. Father, I pray this in the mighty, wonderful name of your precious Son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, worship team. That was beautiful today. And Kayla, I'm so excited for you. This, this is the beginning. I mean, this is a new chapter. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be great. Can't wait to hear, you know, how things are going out there in Phoenix. That's going to be awesome. So today I was thinking, how many of you own homes? All right. How many of you own homes and would love to have them renovated? Love to have them overhauled, new paint, new appliances in the, in the kitchen? Yes. How would you like it if you had a knock on the door tomorrow? And it was Chip and Joanna Gaines. <laughs> or someone like that. Maybe there's somebody that you would prefer over 
Uh, Chip and Joanna, maybe shiplap is not your thing. <laughs> but uh, imagine that Chip and Joanna show up at your door and they say, listen, guys, I'm so excited. We are offering our services to you guys. We are going to just totally remake your home. It is going to be beautiful. It is going to be the house of your dreams. In fact, it's going to be so wonderful that the value of your house is probably going to be double what it's worth right now when we get done. There's only one caveat, only one condition. You have to surrender total control to us. We get to do whatever we want, no questions asked. But trust us, you're going to love it. Would you let them do it? Yes. For those of you who aren't into homes or redecorating or renovations, maybe you're into money. I won't ask if anybody here likes money. I think that's a redundant question. But imagine you get a knock at the door tomorrow, and it's Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett says, I would love to work with you. I know your budget. I know everything about your finances. And good news is, I know exactly what you need. I can take every dime that you make and I can invest it properly. And at the, at the end of two years, you'll be a millionaire. At the end of 10 years, you'll be a billionaire. But there's only one caveat only one condition. You have to surrender complete control of your finances over to me. No questions asked. You allow me to invest that money and to take control of your budget completely. But in the end, in 10 years, you'll be a billionaire. Would you do it? Some say yes and some say no. Let's say that there's a knock at the door. And this time it's Jesus. And let's imagine that you don't faint. And Jesus says, good news. I know everything about your background. I know your strengths and your weaknesses. But I know how to get you to the best ending of your life possible. I know exactly how to arrange your life in such a way that at the end, you will be blessed, you will be happy, no regrets at the end. But there's only one caveat, only one condition. You have to surrender complete control. But in the end, you're going to be happy. Will you do it? You see, in each one of our lives, there is a throne room, or maybe better stated, a control room. I'm talking symbolically. Don't go to a cardiologist and ask them to find this. But in that throne room, there's a throne. We'll just call it a chair. And whoever sits in this chair, this is a very, very important chair. Whoever sits here makes all the decisions. Whoever sits in this chair decides what time you get up in the morning, what time you go to bed. The person who sits in this chair decides what you read, decides what TV shows you're going to watch. What movies you put into your mind. The person who sits in this seat determines what your eyes look at. If you will lust over curvaceous bodies of models with the names like Porsche, Mercedes, and Lexus, <laughs> Audi, BMW, and Cadillac. Whoever sits here determines how you drive in traffic what kind of uh, language you use, and what kind of hand gestures 
get used to express your emotions. <laughs> Whoever sits here determines who you will love. Determines what kind of person you're going to marry. Determines whether if you have kids, how many kids, whether if you homeschool, public school, private school. Whoever sits here determines who you will love and who you will hate. This person decides how you handle conflict and relationships. Determines if you don't get your way, do you just take your football and go your own way? Or do you stay and work it out? Now, we know who deserves to sit in this chair, don't we? And who is that? Jesus. Amen. So we all agree that Jesus should sit here. So let me ask you, why do you think Jesus should sit there? What is it about Jesus that qualifies him, that makes, makes him worthy of sitting here? You said Jesus should sit here. So tell me why. Why should Jesus sit here? God in the flesh. So what was it about Jesus being in the flesh that qualifies him to be here? He knows what we've been through, right? He's endured everything. Well, he was tempted in all, in all things, and yet without sin. He knows all the struggles that we've been through. Any other thoughts? Yes, he can because he's God. He knows, he knows everything. I mean, we, we only know what we, can, what we know through the senses, right? But Jesus sees everything. All authority has been given to him. He knows what's going on in the governments. He knows what's going on at your work, at your school. He knows what's going on everywhere. So who would be best to make decisions in your life but somebody who's all-knowing, right? Does he have the authority to sit in this chair? If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. After Jesus was resurrected, there was a very important message that Jesus wanted to give to his disciples. Something very important that he wanted them to know. Because as you know about the disciples, the, the disciples were interesting men, weren't they? There was something that the disciples were always fighting over. What was that? Who's going to be top dog, right? And I think Jesus wanted to settle that once and for all, didn't he? So Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, it says that all authority, all authority has been given to Jesus. One time I wanted to know exactly, you know, are there any caveats to this? So I looked up the Greek word for all. And you know what all means? It means all. So all authority has been given to Jesus. Does he have the authority to sit there? He does. But does he force it? He doesn't. Now, just as an aside, I don't know what made me think about this. But if God ever had a reason to wipe somebody out, have you ever thought about Jonah? I mean, seriously, here's Jonah. He is given a direct order by God to go to Nineveh. And what did Jonah do? We are not going to Nineveh. I am taking the wheel. And what did God do? Oh, you think so, huh? Was God concerned? Did he think, oh, no, I've lost control of Jonah? No, he just reeled him back in, right? He certainly did. So I think about this. Let's turn to uh, Revelation chapter 3. Just to show the attitude, the heart of our Savior. He's not, I mean, God is such a gracious and a good God. I mean, we talked about this last time that I was here what kind of God do you know? Is he the kind of God that's always looking for an opportunity to zap you 
See, always looking for an opportunity to smack you on the side of the head? No. Jesus has the authority to sit here. It's his. And yet, look at his patience with us. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus is speaking here and he says, I stand at the door and I knock it down, I kick it open. No. What does he say? I stand at the door and knock. What a gentleman. I stand at the door and knock. And he says, if, if anyone will open that door, if anyone will allow me to sit here, he says, I'll have dinner with you. We'll have relationship together. It'll be a beautiful thing. But who's going to open that door? Is Jesus going to force it open? He's waiting for us to open that door. It's interesting. You think about all of creation. All of creation is so obedient to God, isn't it? I mean, God places the planets in their orbit. He says, Earth, I want you to go this direction, this far away from the sun. I want you to go this fast, spin this. The earth says, okay, master. He tells the seas, go this far in the land, but go no further. And the seas say, yes, master. God tells man, come and follow me. And what do we do? Like a spoiled child, we go, no. But God is patient. He is patient. He didn't force Jonah. He was merciful with Peter. He is that way with us as well. So why is it that we don't allow Jesus to sit here? So let's talk about this for a moment, okay? We've just admitted Jesus is qualified. He has the authority to sit here. There's no one who is better qualified, more qualified, who who can lead our life better. So that's who Jesus, I mean, Jesus should be sitting here. But who normally is sitting here? Who's normally sitting here? Yeah. How does that usually go? So why? Why is it when we know that he should, he should be sitting there? Why is it that we move him off and decide to sit there ourselves? Any thoughts? By the way, hello, everybody who's streaming. Hi, Elaine. Hope you're watching. And my wonderful family. Hi, Emily. Hi, Zachary. Sorry about that. When you get old, you'll understand. So why is it? Why do we do that? Why do we take this chair? Fear. What would we be afraid of? I'm, lack of control. Why is control so important for us? What is it that, what are we hoping to control in our lives? If we have control, we're going to prevent what? Pain. Pain. Yes. So then, what does that say? I mean, really, this gets down deep about our relationship with God. What we're saying is, God... I think if you're in control of my life, you're going to ask me to do some things that are painful. I'm not sure I want to go down that, that path. And I'll tell you from personal experience, the, um, the people who most try to control their lives, and I think most of you know this, are the ones who have been abused in their life people who were abused because they don't want to give anyone the ability to ever abuse them again. And for them, it's not just a matter of, you know, sitting on the chair. For them, it's, it's more like this. You know what I'm saying? It's like no one, no one is going to get this chair. And in fact, you've probably noticed this too. Not only do they want to sit on their chair, Where else do they want to sit? Yeah, they want to sit on your chair too. They want to try to control. And it's it's not because they're trying to be mean. It's not because they're trying to be ugly to you. They're just trying to prevent pain. 
So that's one of the reasons that we often find ourselves sitting there. We're trying to control our life situations. But what is that saying about God, our our relationship with God? What are we saying about God? What kind of God do we serve? Remember, we talked about this last week. God says, you know, if you come to me, you have to believe that I exist and that I am. Anybody remember what the second thing was? Yes. So you were listening, Herb. That's awesome. <laughs> a rewarder. And why, why is that important? Why does God want us to believe that he's a rewarder? Why is that so important to God? He wants us to believe that he is good. Yes. That's important to God. And so when we try to take over, what are we signaling to God what we're thinking about him? Yep. The truth hurts sometimes. I think another reason, oh, I'm sorry, anybody else have, besides, you know, the pain, the control, I think we're sometimes deceived that the devil deceives us into believing that somehow we are better qualified to sit there. If you think about when, when the devil was talking to Eve, did the devil ever try to take this chair? Did the, did the devil ever try to get Eve to worship him? No. He was perfectly happy for Eve to do what? You know, and he painted this picture, didn't he? Oh, God, he's such a mean God. You know, he knows that if you take of that fruit, you're going to be like him. He's kind of, you know, he's afraid of you. And he doesn't have your best interest at mind. So why don't you go ahead and take that fruit? Then you can be in control of your life and you can make sure all the decisions that you make will be in your best interest. Some deception going on there, right? And honestly, most of the time, we know better than to take that seat. We know we shouldn't be here. But but what do do we do? What do we end up doing? We kind of half-cheek it. (laughs) You know, Jesus, I I know you know everything and, and, and you're all wise and everything. But just in case you need a little input... Here, let me help you out a bit, right? And, and we just kind of want to, okay, well, you know, here, I'll, I'll help steer and I'll pull that leap. I'll help you make those. And we, we kind of end up being a little like Leah to see. And it's like, okay, I want a little God, but I kind of want to have my hand in the pie too. I want to be able to make those decisions as well. Does God like to share his, his glory with others? It's kind of an all or nothing with God, isn't it? You ever wonder what that makes God feel like when we say, God, I want to take control here. You're not doing, I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like how you're, you're controlling my life. I don't like the direction we're heading. I don't want to go to Nineveh. I don't want to go in this direction. Put yourself in like Chip and Joanna Gaines. Imagine if they came over to your house. They know exactly what to do with your house. They are starting to knock out walls and expand rooms. They're putting on like a new deck. They're doing all these things to improve your house. And then you walk in and you're like, oh, no, 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 no. We're not doing this. I know better. That uh, neutral wall color there? No, 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 no. We're going to put chartreuse there or whatever. We're going to put some, you know, whatever. Help me out, Ashley. What would be a terrible color to put on a wall? Lime green. Lime green. There you go. You know what color my office is? No, it's not. (laughs) It's not. So Jesus is qualified. He has the authority. But from time to time, probably more than we want to admit, we don't let him have his rightful place of dominion in our lives. Now, what happens when we sit in that chair? Let's turn over to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. What happens when we try to take the wheel and do it ourselves? Try to make all the decisions. We don't allow Jesus his rightful place to have dominion when we do not, here's the key word, surrender. 
When we do not surrender control to Jesus, what happens? Alex. It is Luke chapter 6. No problem. And we'll start in verse 46. Jesus says, man, this is a great question right here. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I tell you to do? Why do you call me Lord? Why do you call me your master if you're not going to do the things that I tell you to do? I mean, for I think a lot of us understand this concept. For a lot of us, we don't want to wind up in the lake of fire, so we were more than willing to make Jesus our Savior. We wanted the fire insurance, right? We wanted to protect our lives. So we were happy to make Jesus as Savior, but when we accept Jesus as Savior, He's also supposed to be Lord, our Master, our King. And you can't have one without the other, right? So Jesus is saying, okay, so you're calling me Lord. You're saying I'm your master, but you're not doing the things I'm asking you to do. Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them. So he's going to try to use some symbolism here to try to help us understand why Jesus needs to be the Lord, why he needs to have dominion, why we need to surrender, why we need to allow him to sit on that seat. He says, listen... Let me show you what he's going to be like, a person who makes me their master, a person who obeys me. He says in verse 48, he's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundations on rock. So here's a house built on, you know, a a rock foundation, solid. Jesus going on says, now when the flood came, And the stream beat vehemently against the house. So here's a person who symbolically is obeying Jesus. Do the storms come to those people who obey Jesus? Yeah. Amen. But there's something about this house, though. The storms still come, but even though this this, uh, thunderstorm rolls in, you got this flood coming, and it's beating against this house, it could not shake it. Those people who have Jesus sitting here, you know them because they are not shaken. Verse 49, but those who hear and do nothing, those who do not let Jesus have this seat, said it's like a man who built his house on the earth or on sand without a foundation. Now, this same storm comes, this same flood comes, but what happens to the house? He says, it immediately fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So in life, Jesus is giving us two options. He's saying, you can either let me be the Lord and master of your life, and you can have a house that will stand against the storms, or you can do it your way. I want to let you decide, but be forewarned. Your house won't stand. I got a simple question for you. Which house do you want? You want the house on on stone, on rock, or you want the one built on sand? I'm thinking rock. That's what I think. But if, if right now, Your life is more like that second house. If your life, and I'm speaking to myself as well, if your life is turned upside down, if your life is full of fear and worry and doubt, if you feel insufficient or unworthy, if you feel like your life is off course, you might want to take a look and see Who's sitting on the chair? The great theologian Carrie Underwood once said, Jesus, take the wheel. (laughs) Who's got the wheel in your life? I like that. You've probably seen the meme that's floating around right now. It's like Jesus has the wheel, but sometimes it feels like we're off-roading. You know that feeling? Yes. 
let me just ask you to take a moment. Just, just close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to just look into, just look into your heart, look in your spirit. And, and look for that chair. And just be honest with yourself. Who do you see sitting in that chair? And is that who you really want sitting there? Okay, eyes open. Let's turn to Luke chapter 15. Jesus gave us another story because I believe this was really important. I think this is, this is actually crucial because we know that there's only one way to eternal life and it's through Jesus. And he says every day, I mean, I'm sorry, one day every knee will bow and every tongue is going to confess what? Why don't we just do it now? Can you confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord? Amen. Luke chapter 15, and let's start in verse 11. We know this story. It's the story of the prodigal son. But it's a story that tells us what happens when we try to sit in that chair, when we try to take control of our lives, and we try to do it on our own power. Jesus said, in verse 11, a certain man had two sons, and the younger said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. He wanted to do things his way. He wanted to live life his way. And so the dad divided to them the livelihood, and not many days later, the, young, the younger son gathered all together, and he journeyed to a far country. I'm imagining a place, you know, probably like Las Vegas, right? He goes off to this far country and he wasted all his possessions with prodigal living. Probably hanging out with his buds, you know, playing blackjack, hanging out with women of ill repute, and he just spent all his money. And I'm sure at the time he was having a blast and he was probably thinking, sitting on this chair is the best thing I've ever done in my life. Making decisions for myself was the best thing. You ever been a teenager and thought that way? No one knows better than me. And, and you know, at first it does kind of feel good when you're making your own decisions. You're like, I knew mom and dad didn't know anything. And at first it's a lot of fun until reality hits, right? And that's what happened to this young man. Verse 14, but when he had spent everything and there arose a severe famine in that land because they had to pay high taxes for all the social programs that came as the result of the pandemic that hit earlier <laughs> that year. Sorry, you can erase that. There was a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. And this young man would have gladly filled his stomach. He was so hungry, he would have eaten pig slop. But no one had mercy on him. No one had. You know, the world looks like a lot of fun. Until you get into it and you find out people, you know, as long as things are going good, they'll be your friends. But once the money's gone, suddenly no one wanted anything to do with this young man. But when he came to himself, this is one of the most monumental expressions in the Bible. I think almost everyone here in this room has had a when he came to himself moment, haven't you? When God opens your eyes and you realize, I have absolutely no business sitting there. When he finally came to himself, he said, how many are my father's hired servants? They have plenty and to spare. And here I am perishing with hunger. I am going to arise. I'm going to go to my dad. He knew where to go. I want to go back to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against you, against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, but make me to be like one of your hired servants. I, I no longer 
want control of my life. I just, I, I want to be a slave for you, Father. Just take care of me. Just take care of me. How did the Father receive this? Verse 20. So he arose and went back to his father. And when he was still a great way away, great way off, his father saw him. A couple of things I think are interesting. One, he saw him. It makes you wonder, you know, did the dad go to this hill on his property? And every day did he stand and he looked over thinking, is this the day my son come home? comes home? But another thing too, let me ask you this. When the son made the decision to go to Las Vegas, did the dad go after him? That is a very critical point of understanding to always remember about God. If you decide not to sit there, God is patient and kind and graceful. He'll let you If you want to burn your hand on the stove, he'll let you do it. But don't expect him to walk there with you and pull it back for you. If you've decided, God, I don't want you to sit here, he's going to let you do your thing. And he's going to wait for you to return. So his father sees him a great way away. And then totally against the custom of the day, The father saw him, had compassion, and ran. Here is this older man, dignified. He shouldn't have been running. But he was because he had such love for his son. He was so happy to see him. He ran and he kissed him. And the son repents and says, Father, I've sinned against heaven in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And then his father just stops him, stops him in mid-speech. And he goes and tells the servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. He must have been a sight. You know, if he was out there feeding the pigs, you can just imagine how filthy he must have been, how ragged his clothes. He probably didn't look anything like how he looked when he left his dad. The dad says, hey, let's put a robe on him and put a ring on his, on his hand and sandals on his feet so everybody will know he's welcome back into the family. Oh, there's more rejoicing over the one who repents than the 99 who don't need to repent. Bring the fatted calf and let's kill it and let's eat and be merry. So there's this party. Why? Because the father says, this is my son. He was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found and they began to be merry. It's the craziest thing. When did this young man's life turn around and start getting better? When he finally gave up, when he finally surrendered and said, I'm not going to try to control my life anymore. You know when our life gets better? It's when we let God have control. And it doesn't seem like it in the natural mind. Your friends in the world will think you're crazy. You're going to let God tell you what food to put in your mouth, what vacations you're going to take, what movies you go to see. What games you play? Really? We're already in Luke. Uh, Turn uh, back a couple of pages to uh, Luke chapter 9. Christianity is full of these kind of seemingly um, contradictory things. Here's another one that Jesus tells us. Luke chapter 9, verse 24. Jesus says, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Well, that doesn't make sense. If you're trying to save your life, how can you lose it? Somebody here with wisdom, tell me. How is it a person who tries to control their life? If you're, if you're a parent and you try to lock your kids down, try to keep them in the cellar, lock them up, and never let them out into the world so that they can never be harmed... When your kids are finally 18, do they say, thanks, mom and dad, for being so controlling in my life? What normally happens? Yes, that kid is out of there. They lose that kid. What happens when we try to lock down our lives and it's like, I'm going to live in a bubble. No harm is ever going to come to me. I I know this one family. 
who decided they wanted to live off the grid. Know anybody who wants to live off the grid? Those are crazy people. I'm just kidding. Some of you, I know, that's probably a dream for some of you. But he was determined. He didn't want the government to know where his family lived. So he was, uh, had no electricity, no uh, utilities run to his place. He still had to sign a deed at the courthouse. How is that going to keep the government from knowing where you live? I haven't figured that one out yet. But he thought, I'm going to have everything. I'm going to supply everything myself. He, he bought these huge solar panels and the batteries and the backup generator. And he, and he found out um, that he could, his power supply that he had come up with wasn't enough to take care of his family's needs. And, and the wife was, wasn't real happy because she found out that she, she couldn't cook with a normal stove. She had to get one of those like RV stoves, you know, the little small stove. That's kind of, yeah. And, and the, the children couldn't, couldn't use things like blow dryers or, or computers and, and things like that. And, and so he had to come up with like this huge backup generator, this big diesel powered things. And I don't know how much he spent for that. And then after like, uh, five or ten years of living off the grid like this, and listen, I'm not a, a upset with this guy or in any way want to put him down, but it's just an example of what happens when people try to save their lives. What happens? He was so fearful of, of the government coming in. You know what happens to those batteries after about five or ten years? Because, you know, the solar power has to go into a battery, and then the battery goes into your ha- house through an inverter, right? So what happens after five or ten years? You have to replace the batteries, now, these batteries were enormous. They don't look like the batteries that are in your car. Would you like to guess how much these batteries were? Thousands of dollars. So he'd already spent thousands of dollars to set it up, extra thousands to get this huge backup generator, and now more thousands of dollars for the, for the battery, all because he was trying to protect himself from a perceived danger. And in the process, do you know what his family thought about him? Do you think that they were real happy being there? What happens? I mean, does this make sense, what Jesus is saying here? You try, if you try to, on your own power, save your life without God. And listen, I know that there are things, there are things that we should be wise about, okay? I'm not going to have just anything, you know, stuck in my arm and, you know, injected into my body. There are certain things that I'm going to... I want to do the best I can, right, to protect myself. I think that's what God expects of us. But am I going to be able to protect me and my family from every possible threat that's out there? No. No. That mindset is deadly, Jesus is saying. You try to, you try to save your life without... God being a part of that, you're going to lose it. But whoever, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. The moment that we give God control, our lives become so much better because he knows more than all of us, any of us, how to run our life. Can you imagine, like, if you're fearful, um, anybody here like roller coasters? I love roller coasters, but I've never gotten over the fear of once you're in the thing, of thinking that that belt might break. This might be the one, one time out of a billion it's going to break. This will be the time. Or, or that little safety arm thing that they bolt you in with. This will be the one time that that one bolt that was manufactured in, in you know, some third world country is going to snap, right? And out I go. It, has anyone here ever completely ridded yourself of that fear? I mean, I don't think, yeah. But have you ever thought about this? If a, an angel or a prophet came up to you and said, you never have to worry. Today, I have a prophecy for you given from heaven that nothing today bad, nothing bad will happen to you today. You will not fall out of any of those roller coasters. Can you imagine how much more you would enjoy the rides if you knew 100% for sure that nothing bad was going to happen to you? When God is in control of our lives, 
even when it doesn't go exactly the way that we want to, there's a 100% chance that all things will work together for good. That the end result will always be good because he is a good God. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Matthew 11, verse 28. So why would Jesus want this seat? Why would he want us to surrender our control over to him? Because he really and truly does want the best for us. And here's an example of this. Here's Jesus telling all of us today. Here's a message from Jesus to each one of us here today. Imagine Jesus is standing in front of you and he's telling you these words. This is a personal message for you. Come to me, whatever your name is. Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, please. Please surrender. Learn from me because I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Is that, is that the characteristics? Are those the characteristics that you see in Jesus? I'm gentle and I'm lowly in heart. Why, do, why is it that he's wanting us to take his yoke? He says, I want you to find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, you know what? I know, I know what you're going through. I know what you're going through. And I know your burden is heavy. And Jesus is saying, please bring it to me and take my yoke. You know what? You've been sitting on that seat and it's wearing you out. I mean, he has compassion on us. He's like, my friend, you've been sitting here trying to control yourself, control everything else and everybody. And it's killing you. You are frazzled. And I'm telling you, Jesus is saying, come to me. I want to help you. Let me take control. If you'll just trust me. If you'll just trust me. Moving Elaine to Texas. Elaine, this is not a subliminal message, Elaine. <laughs> Moving to Texas, Elaine, is the best thing that God could ever want for you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to do that, didn't I? I'm sorry. <laughs> a man should not use the pulpit for his own personal gain. I believe Jesus is saying to all of us, are you ready yet? Are you ready for me to take control? Are you ready to surrender? For the final passage, let's turn to Mark chapter 10. We'll begin wrapping it up. I know when you're young, that's the favorite thing that, that any minister can say, right? Any, any preacher. In conclusion, right? Mark chapter 10, verse 21. I want you to think about this. This is a story most of us know. It's the rich young ruler. And really, you know, the rich young ruler, he had a good heart. He wanted to know, what do I need to do to have eternal life? And he went to the right person, didn't he? He went to Jesus. And he's like, what do I need to do? Jesus looking at him, and I love how Mark puts this in. Jesus looked at him and said, and, and he loved him. Did you notice that? He loved him. He had compassion on this, this young man. And he said, my friend, there's only one thing that you lack. I see that you are burdened with all of these possessions. I see you're burdened with this huge house and these expensive cars with all the little trinkets that you've got. I see that you're burdened with all your possessions. Go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. 
Help them out. They need help. He didn't just say, you know, just throw them away. He said, go and give them to the poor. And you're going to have treasure in heaven. But then he says, because he loved this man, he said, come take up the cross. Surrender. Surrender. Take up the cross and follow me. That was the best advice that Jesus could have given him. Amen? Surrender. I want to help you. Jesus is knocking. He's knocking at the door. He wants us to open it. He's standing at the top of the hill like the prodigal son's dad. And he's waiting. You probably will never get Chip and Joanna Gaines to offer to renovate your house. I'm sorry. You'll probably never get Warren Buffett to come and personally take your finances and make you a billionaire. But you do have a Savior who wants desperately to help you. He wants to take control so that your life will get better. It'll be amazing. You know, friends, today would be a great day to surrender to Jesus. If you've already committed your life to Jesus, the question would be, and I'm asking this of myself, have I given my Savior, my Lord, my Master, complete control? It's easy to say, well, God, I'll let you have control of these parts of my life, but let me have control of these parts over here. Does he have complete control? Today might be a good day to say, Jesus, take the whole wheel. Jesus, take complete control of my life. And if you have not yet made Jesus your Savior, Today would be a good day to start that conversation. And I and the others here would love to talk to you about that if God is working on your heart to make Jesus your Lord, your master. It'll be the best decision you'll ever make. I promise. Let me just pray on the way out. Father in heaven, again, I just thank you so much for your son that you gave him to us, that we could have eternal life. And Lord, as, as I wrap up this message, I just pray that it has fallen on fertile ground and that we will all, myself included, surrender and say, Father, your will be done and not my own. Lord, do with us as you will. Make us to be what you desire us to be. We look forward, Lord, to what you're going to do in our lives. Have your place of dominion. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Love you guys. God bless you all.